Hi friends, my name is Tris, and this is No Boilerplate, focusing on fast, technical videos. I'm going to talk to you about two features of Rust that no other popular language has. It's these two features that make Rust both as low level as C and as high level as Lisp, whereas most other popular languages are stuck somewhere in the middle. These two superpowers are Rust's macros and the unsafe system. There are high, mid, and low level languages. Macros give you access to high level language features. This category of techniques has a lot of different names, metaprogramming, templating, macros, or preprocessors. I'm going to call them build tools, because many languages have incomplete metaprogramming implementations that provide a very narrow set of features that I don't want you to mix up. Whereas in Rust, the macro system is so powerful, you can create your entire build tooling using it, inside the compiler. Python's metaprogramming allows classes to build classes. Rust's metaprogramming is Turing complete and can do anything, including accessing the disk and network. Conversely, down at the low level, the unsafe system allows you the direct hardware access that every programming language uses, but only a few privileged C developers, i.e. the ones who first wrote the language, can use directly. In both high and low level, other languages say, here is the line, you may never cross it. Rust says, cross here if you know what you're doing. Let's talk about the unsafe system first. In most languages, you have a flaw to your abstraction that you can't get lower than without throwing away the language itself. These JavaScript and Python functions are actually written in C, and you'll be writing your own C code if you want to tweak them. This is how high-level languages are typically written. Even Go, a language that is often compared to Rust, is written partly in C++ and assembly. Fundamental functions and language features previously have only been written in C. High-level developer ergonomics and low-level hardware control are thought of as mutually exclusive. They perhaps were, until now. Rust guarantees that you don't need to worry about memory management. The compiler will help you as long as you obey the rules that I outlined in my last video. You may have heard the buzzword that linked lists are impossible to make in Rust. This is not true. The confusion arises because they're only impossible in safe Rust, which is where we, as application developers, spend all our time. If you want to make a linked list, as they did here in the standard library, you first step down into unsafe Rust, where you promise the compiler that you know what you are doing. Then, in your safe code, you can now use the safe abstraction you have just built. This is analogous to writing C extensions for Python or Ruby, or writing JNI to access native libraries in Java. You're promising that you've checked the safety of the code. If you write a C Python extension, you must throw out all of Python's ergonomics and safety and learn a whole new language with vastly different rules and constraints. In Rust, you need learn hardly anything more to write code in an unsafe block. Unsafe operations are those that can potentially violate the memory safety guarantees of Rust's static semantics. This list of language level features cannot be used in the safe subset of Rust. Have you noticed the one thing that links all the items in this list of things you can only do in unsafe Rust? Unsafe operations are for framework authors. You and I, as web developers or game developers or application developers, will certainly never write unsafe code in our normal work, just as we never did before. However, the frameworks we use, the crates and third-party Rust libraries, will be faster, more powerful, and more importantly, be pure Rust with no C dependencies because of the unsafe system. The unsafe block is a brilliant feature that keeps us writing Rust when other programming languages would have to reach for C. The language designers incorporated it to avoid the unsafety of C. I like it because I don't have to learn any more languages. On to part two, macros. Let's talk about the rep wrap. To build a rep wrap, you first build your own bad 3D printer with homemade parts and plans from the internet. Then you use that printer to print a better printer. This is like using macros. With other programming languages, you adapt the problem to the language. With Rust, you also can adapt the language to the problem. This sounds terrifying in traditional languages. Even with metaprogramming happy languages like Python and Ruby, where you can overwrite the addition operator and write DSLs, it's considered bad form and confusing for the next person. Macros are Rust code that do two things. One, they run at compile time, and two, they can modify your source code. These two properties allow you to do incredible magic that isn't possible in nearly all other languages. 
Lisps being the big exception. Let's talk about running at compile time first. Macros are clearly notated in Rust by the exclamation mark, or bang, at the end of the name. The compiler enforces this convention, of course. This tells you, the developer, that some compile time execution is going to happen. This is in contrast to Python or Ruby, where it is not obvious what is happening. In this case, the query macro from the excellent SQLX library runs that SQL query on your local dev database at compile time in a rolled back transaction. The macro doesn't know what the value of organization will be. It will only be populated at runtime, perhaps on your production server or your customer's computer. However, thanks to the rich type system, the macro does know exactly what kind of value it will be. If it's a number, it knows the upper and lower bounds of that number. If it's a string, it knows it's valid UTF-8, and so on. Because of this, the macro can generate a valid organization at compile time, probably random data, and feed that into the database's transaction to test a real query. If there is an error, the compiler feeds back to you using the same errors you've seen in non-macro Rust code. This means your IDE, using LSP or the command line using Cargo, has the same rich errors Rust is famous for. I think this is a good way to think about macros. What do build tools do? They collect build artifacts, like images and config. They change behavior of the app depending on configuration files. They bundle up loose files into more readily deployable blobs. And they rewrite source code from a form that is easier for the human, perhaps JSX or SAS, into a form that is easier for the machine, like JavaScript or CSS. Let's talk about how macros modify your source code. Macros, like unsafe code, are a little more difficult to read than normal Rust. But they're only used by very experienced crate and framework authors, not the end developer like me, who just wants to make my cool Tetris clone in WebAssembly. Note that the numerical result of 3 is not inserted into the code here. The addition must still be executed at runtime. It's the syntax that has been swapped around at compile time. This distinction between functions that execute at runtime and macros that execute at compile time is essential. Most languages have no access to compile time, and you are instead forced into building non-standard error-prone tools that you run before executing your code as preprocessors. Let's look at a practical example of a Rust syntax macro. The CMD macro is from the command macros crate. You could have done this with a function, but then you'd be calling a function at runtime with the small overhead a function call incurs. You also would have needed commas in there. Note that the CMD macro introduces new syntax, not just an abstraction. Macros are an important part of Rust's zero-cost abstractions. Running them at compile time on the developer's machine allows new syntax to be added without waiting for a new edition of the language to be produced, clearly signposted and scoped inside the macro. You also don't need permission. Python finally has a case statement, but it took a long time to arrive, didn't it? The case for the case statement was officially put forward by Python's author Guido in 2006, right about the time I started writing Python. However, when he presented it at PyCon in 2007, the audience felt it was unnecessary, and so the proposal was rejected. This new syntax, even one that is functionally identical to nested if statements, was so hard to build that they took 15 years to agree to do it. In Rust, new syntax is a library. For example, here is a macro that looks like a native Rust match statement, but is actually creating roots in the hyper HTTP server. You can clearly see where the macro is on line 2 because of the bang at the end of match request. A common complaint from people who have never compiled Rust is that Rust's build times are slow. They are indeed a little slower than Go or Java, but that's because Rust is doing work for you. A lot more happens at Rust build time than in most other languages. Here, as I build the Rocket Web Framework's Hello World example in 10 seconds, 100 libraries compiled in total, many things happen in Rust that do not happen in other languages. Macros are being executed, arbitrary code is running, and macros themselves can insert further macros in your code, such as the print line macro, that will then require further expansion. The compiler, in conjunction with the rich type system, is proving that all code, both yours and imported libraries, does not break either your contracts or those built in to the language or libraries. And the borrow checker is exhaustively proving that no execution paths can break the memory guarantees of the language. These few extra seconds of build time equates to hours, days, 
weeks of gained productivity because you're not hunting bugs in log files. Oh, and the second and all subsequent times you build this, it takes no time at all. In previous videos, I've talked about how there's no Rust 2.0, and you see why that is now, don't you? There's no need to wait for a version 2 that may never arrive. You can write new language features today, and people have. Async, SERDI, contracts, proof systems, literals for list and maps, etc. The combination of low-level hardware access and high-level macros has given us the perfect language, not just now, but for the next 40 years. The Rust developers have built this incredible hybrid language. They didn't only make a complicated low-level language where you can do pointer arithmetic, nor did they just make a high-level language where you have no easy access to the underlying system, forcing you to write C to get at it. They gave us a language that has both. With Rust, it's turtles all the way down. If you'd like to see what you can write in Rust, click the top video. I used it to make a fun retro computer visualization for my sci-fi and mental health podcast, Lost Terminal. And if you'd like to watch more of my fast technical videos, click the bottom video. Transcripts and markdown source code are available on GitHub, links in the description. Thank you so much for watching. See you next time.